All of my favorite foods include gluten. It's like the powerhouse behind noodles, bread, fried chicken, all the greats, really. Cookies, cakes, they've all got gluten in them. But I think it's kind of confusing as an ingredient for a lot of people. So I wanna take a look at three of the most important factors in determining how gluten kind of builds itself. Hydration, protein strength, and time. So if we want to really dig into gluten, I think we should first take a look at exactly what gluten is. This is a simple dough made of just bread flour and water. Now gluten is non-water soluble. So if we take a bucket full of water and start kneading this dough underneath the water, all the starch that is water soluble will come right out. So it gets nice and cloudy and gross. Ugh, spill it everywhere around electronics. That seems like a real safe solution. Always a good idea. If this is my last video, you know why. <laughs> Did it in the first minute, that's always good. Just keep kneading, wash all the starches away. It's super hard to do this underwater. It's very slimy and gross. Kind of looks like a sponge, but it's made up of all these long fibers. Now, after a little while of kneading underwater, this is basically what you end up with. A stringy, lumpy mass. And as you work it, it gets thicker and thicker and stronger and stronger. This is what makes noodles and breads and cakes hold their structure. It makes noodles elastic. It makes cakes and breads form bubbles that carbon dioxide can fill up. It's really what enables those structures all together. This is the good stuff. So this is what we're going to take a look at. But as it is now, it's basically just pinata glue. So let's actually apply this knowledge, go make some noodles and use those to kind of see how hydration affects gluten structure. And let's do that now so I can go wash my hands. For our first experiment, we're gonna make three different batches of noodles using three different liquids. First, we're gonna use just plain tap water. Second, we're gonna use con sweet, an alkali solution used for ramen noodles and some Chinese noodles. And third, we're gonna use just plain egg yolk. We're gonna make pasta. Straight up. To each liquid, we'll add all-purpose or AP flour until it comes together. So we'll mix it together until it comes into a nice dough, and then we'll knead it to build up the structure. After a few minutes of kneading and working more flour, you end up with a nice, pliable lump of dough. We'll throw it right back in its container. We'll throw a cover on it and set it aside for an hour. When your dough is just about ready, it's time to set up the pasta machine. Most of these are hand cranked. This one is not, it has a little motor on it because I make a lot of noodles and I'm lazy about it. We're going to set the motor onto the extruder and set it to zero. So this is the lowest setting. It is the thickest noodle. We're also going to dust our counter with flour because we're going to need to flour our noodles a little bit as we go. Here's our water dough. Basically what you want to see is that you can mush it out without it like rising back. So we're getting a nice smooth, soft dough at this point. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the thickest four notches, so zero through three, several times. And each time we hit three, we'll fold it in half and then bring it back through zero again. So we'll switch our roller to one, go through again. And two. three. Once you've got a dough that's nice and smooth and has a nice grain to it, then we throw it onto number four and then number five. Now I get it down to 1.5 millimeters.
All right, so now we got a nice smooth dough, but it's still a little moist. If we cut it now, the noodles will all stick together. So I'm just gonna set it aside for a little bit and let it rest. This will dry it out just a touch. We're not gonna set it aside for too long, but by the time the others are done, this will be ready to cut. All right, that's three doughs ready to go. Time to get out the sheet tray, because that's where we're gonna throw our finished noodles. So we're gonna slide this over, set this here, and move our motor over to the Capellini extruder. That is also 1.5 millimeters, which is gonna give us a nice square noodle. Seems like not a great thing, but it's basically the point is, it's gonna be equal thickness in both dimensions. That'll be great. So, take a bench scraper, cut it off. Oh, that seems like a good amount. Then I'm gonna drag that onto here. Yeah, we got almost thirds. So now, take our sheet, run it right through the cap on the cutter. And we want to dust it with flour right away, otherwise they will stick together for sure. So we'll take a baking sheet with flour, toss the noodles one more time, clean up our little trimmings, and then on to the next noodle. All right, so these are our raw noodles. Let's give these a quick dunk in some boiling water and get on to our test results. All right, three different noodles, water only. Consui solution is about five-ish percent, maybe six. Uh, and then we have egg yolk. That's it. Otherwise, all AP flour, all around 8% protein. <laughs> this one fell apart as I picked it up. Hilarious. Okay, so this is just a water noodle. This has got a little bit of stretch to it, just a bit. You can see how far I can get apart and then you can start to see it deteriorate and then it snaps. It, it doesn't really have much to give in the way of elasticity. Some of these noodles got pretty short, unfortunately. Makes it hard to demonstrate. But if you pull on them and they snap back pretty quickly, they don't just like drop. It gives us a kind of a baseline. They, they're not like super springy, they don't snap back, but they don't just like fall. So if we now look at the ramen noodle, not ramen noodle, it's a consui noodle. I wouldn't call this a ramen noodle because it doesn't have high enough protein. These guys get way stretchier. Look at that. And it snaps way across, like from one finger to the other. Just a completely different noodle, and all that changed was a little bit of a pH bump. That wasn't even that much. So, now, get the starchy noodle off me. We have our egg noodles. This is not far off from something that I would actually want to eat. Some of these other ones are not optimized. But I usually make my pasta with uh, egg yolk, a little bit of uh, maybe like a double zero flour. AP flour isn't that far off. It's a little high gluten. It's a little uh, it's a little rougher texture, but otherwise this is pretty close. I would actually eat this pasta. No, it it does hold up a little better than the water noodles, but not much. And when it tears, it just drops. There's not much springiness to it. It's just it swings down. 
Now, if you think about pie crust as compared to bread, like what you're looking at in terms of the difference in textures is, is, is mainly about fat capping off the gluten chains. That's the same thing that's happening here. We're getting more of a plastic structure rather than a pliable elastic structure. It's, it's just so much more rigid and it, it can't get very springy. So with just a minor change in the hydration chemistry of these three noodles, we see a huge difference. Like there's a, a pretty massive range of textures going on here. This one, even though it's not springy, it has a lot more bite because of that new rigidity. Ramen on the other hand, gets really springy. It can get really wrinkly if you crinkle it up uh, when you're cooking it. Flour noodles, probably wouldn't eat. They're very sticky and like kind of uncomfortable. They might make a good soup noodle, but I think they're probably gonna like dissolve pretty quickly. So with only these like minor changes in, in just the hydration, adding some fat, increasing the pH level, we see a pretty big difference in terms of the actual outcome. What happens now if we actually go in and change the protein strength of the flour? It's getting pretty late tonight, so we'll do that in the morning. And the best thing I can think of is pancakes. If there's one thing you see in every pancake recipe, it's to not over whip the batter. You don't want any gluten to form. It really messes with it. But I think that sets us up for a pretty interesting experiment in terms of what happens when you overdevelop a gluten structure. So for this, I want to take each of three different flours, completely develop their gluten to the maximum potential, and see how it affects the texture. First, we have our basic all-purpose flour. AP flour. This is about 8% protein, mostly gluten. Uh, this is a good baseline for any gluten comparison. Next, we've got buckwheat flour. This has no gluten at all. It's not really a wheat. It's something else, but it is delicious and it makes great pancakes. Last, we've got semolina. This is a hard wheat, made, uh, it's made from a hard wheat called durum. And this is commonly used in pasta, also makes great pancakes, very delicious. But it has a ton of gluten. It actually has 14 to 16% gluten, which means we're gonna end up with a pretty like dense gluten structure. So I'm gonna take each of these, add in the rest of our dry ingredients for the pancakes, which is just sugar, baking soda, baking powder and a little bit of salt. And then here I've got butter, butter, milk, and milk. The butter had to be melted, so you heat up the rest of the ingredients as well so that it doesn't re-solidify. Mix that in. Be sure to spill everywhere before realizing you just need bigger containers anyway. All right, then we're gonna crack one egg into each. All right, I'm gonna set those aside, set up a griddle. Now an electric griddle like this gives us some benefits, mainly in controlling the temperature that we get. Once you've got a griddle nice and preheated, we'll just pour out a little bit of pancake batter onto it. Hopefully this isn't a sacrificial one. All right, so here we have our three different pancakes. These are the buckwheat pancakes, the all-purpose flour pancakes, very warm, uh, and the semolina pancake. So at least in these two, there's quite a spongy texture, like a lot of air escaped, which to me is normally symptomatic of like underdeveloped gluten. In this case, there's no gluten at all. But I think in this case, it's due to uh, the, the milling of this kind of grain, like it's a coarser mill, so it's kind of more like sand than a flour. 
Uh, but you can kind of immediately see a pretty big difference in terms of height. Like there's definitely like a gradation in terms of how tall they got. Let's uh, pull these back. This one's got a significant like dome action going on. This one definitely like, it's seized up around the edges, you can see. I think that's due to the, the higher gluten content, but also the like massive overwhipping. So as soon as it hit the griddle, it like seized up. Then this one is just, it's super flexible. It's very thin, it's very light. It tears very easily. That's actually still a good pancake, but there's no gluten to develop. So it seems pretty logical that that would happen. Let's actually pull these back and try and tear up these big guys. This one's already got a little tear out of it, but when you open it up, it's got these giant bubbles along the bottom. It's a little hot still, so it's a bit wet looking, but you can see this like row of bubbles along here. That would explain the massive like doming. It's, it's just holding in all the bubbles. Buckwheat on the other hand, super tender, no bubbles at all inside. It's like there's some foam action, but it's basically just like where things got trapped in starch, I guess. There's not a lot going on in terms of lift where here there was a, a huge amount. <sighs> Holy, this is a tough guy. This is a tough little guy and it's dense. Look at that. Super dense bubble structure. I don't know if that's super visible, but it's, it's like a very fine white bread. And it's rubbery, like that is tough to eat. This one's firm, but it's a lot more pleasant than this one. And I think that again comes down to the milling. Look at these bubbles. That's crazy. I, I mean, I suppose the amount of air in there would reduce the, the toughness. It's chonky. This guy, this is basically a little brown hockey puck. This is, oof. It's so rubbery and it's so dense. And this one is just completely tender. So clearly these are a pretty exaggerated form of pancake. These are not what you would normally make. These, you shouldn't over whip your batter, but it does paint a clear picture of just how gluten can trap air. It can build this like dense network. So let's look at the last factor, time. There are a lot of ways that time affects gluten, usually by just allowing it to relax, but if there's one case where I think time is like very confusing for a lot of people, it's with proofing. Now, if you've watched any baking shows or whatever, like people talk about proofing all the time. It's really easy to either under or over proof, but it's actually a really simple process and it's really simple to know whether or not something is proofed correctly or not. So I wanted to experiment with uh, one of my favorite recipes. It's some plain yeast rolls. I use them for burger buns all the time and just proof three different batches to different lengths of time. So we'll have one that's unproofed, one that's correctly proofed, and one that's overproofed, basically like double proofed. So I've made this bun recipe dozens of times, and basically I'm gonna start each of them 45 minutes apart. I know that's about how long it takes in my kitchen. So the, the first one will be proofed twice as long as the second one, and the third one will be proofed for zero time. It'll go directly into the oven. First up, I'm gonna start the bulk ferment by taking half of our flour and combining an equal amount of water. This is a uh, warm water, maybe like a hundred degrees Fahrenheit and a little bit of yeast. 
And then I'm just gonna stir that together to combine it and allow it to sit for a while and ferment. That's, I think we'll do 45 minutes is what I usually do here. It should reach about a liter of volume in that time. So we just wanna whip it together as much as we can. So now we've got our dough together. We'll throw a lid on that and set it aside to ferment. Once we've got our nice fermented batter, we're gonna scrape it out into a mixing bowl. To that, we'll add a little bit of oil, sugar, and salt. And then the other half of our flour. Make sure to launch as much of it as you can onto your mixer. Scrape off your finger that you stupidly got dirty. And then snap the work bowl into the mixer. We're gonna mix this with a dough hook until it comes together in a smooth, supple mass. Get a baking sheet and a silicone baking mat, and we'll lightly oil the baking mat. Once we've got that oiled, measure our dough out into eight equal parts. All right, so we're at 513 grams. We want eight buns, so quick math says that's gonna be about 64 grams. Let's just tear this up in a couple of chunks. We get 64 grams and we stretch them, pull them back until we get a nice smooth top. We just pull the, the top over the bottom. And then you end up with a nice smooth little ball. And we just pop that right on the sheet. We do that seven more times. We'll have our first batch. So we just wanna space them out evenly on the tray so that we end up getting nice, evenly sized biscuits because they will expand to touch each other. So we just wanna make sure that they've got about the same space to grow. Just take a little bit of cling film, put the tray, press it down along the silicone. There we go. So we'll set those aside to proof for about 45 minutes while we set up our next batch. Comes time to check whether or not your buns are proofed or not, there's a really simple test. Push in, if it doesn't spring back, it's at least proofed. The underproofed one springs back really fast, almost to the point where you can't see it anymore. Once the buns are nice and brown on top, pull them out onto a cooling rack and almost immediately we can see a pretty significant difference. Be sure to knock your buns apart. There we go. Overproofed, proofed correctly, underproofed. All right, so here we have our finished buns. Clearly there's a pretty big difference. Our overproofed buns expanded a lot horizontally. So you can see that they really filled out the maximum space on the tray. 
Our correctly proofed ones are a bit more upright. They're kind of a, almost a tennis ball shape. Much nicer, These, while well, these are like much flatter. Our underproofed ones actually have a bit of like an egg shape going on. They're, they're very tall in the middle and th they gained a lot of height very quickly in the oven. So they've got a lot of whiteness ar around the edges, a little less on top, but still they're pretty pale compared to, I mean, even the correctly proofed ones. Let's just pull off one of each of these here. Now these overproofed ones had a lot less height gain in the oven. So they got brown further down the sides. They're much more consistent throughout while these are a bit more pale on the sides because they were still gaining some height with the oven spring. It's the first 20% of the bake time, they rapidly shoot up. And then we've got these pale guys. It's a pretty big difference here in terms of overall coloration. These were, these were growing very rapidly during that oven spring and I don't think they ever got a chance to settle in and brown. So let's look at what they're like on the inside. Just cut these in half. There's our overproof bun. There's our correctly proof bun. There's our underproof bun. Let's get the rest of these out of here. So with our overproof bun, We've actually got a bit of dryness going on. I know you can't feel it, but it's a little crusty. Like, and we're actually seeing a little bit of crumbliness here. Um, the skin is super thin compared to some of the others. It, it's a little bit less rigid or like it, it just is very papery. It just tears pretty like cleanly. It fragments when you tear it rather than having whole chunks. Now, our correctly proofed one is a, a bit moister, actually significantly moister. This is kind of a totally different biscuit. It's a whole other biscuit. But you can see when you push in, it does spring back pretty quickly. Like the divots don't stay. It's not, it's not just giving up. Now the underproofed ones, these are dense. Look at that. If you push in, yeah, it stays around. It's kind of like the opposite of how it proofed. It comes back a little bit, but it's definitely got a residual bump. Whereas this one is like pretty much gone now. With the overproofed, it actually springs back immediately. So we've got a pretty interesting like reversal of how you proof them versus how they turn out. Now, none of these are really the end of the world. Having a slightly gummy bun isn't gonna kill you and having a slightly dry bun isn't gonna kill you either. You could easily get anywhere in between this gradient and I would be happy to eat it. But what we ended up with in this middle, correctly proofed instance, was the optimal match of browning and moisture. We wanted to keep that like light, slightly doughy, like we don't want it to be gummy but we want it to not be dry either we want it to be moist and tender and that's what we ended up with here we got maximum browning we got maximum carbon dioxide growth without sacrificing that moisture so now the last race against time is just how fast you can eat them. So obviously this is a non-exhaustive list of factors that affect gluten development. I couldn't possibly cover all of those in one video. But just to recap, if you end up with something that is a little too elastic, a little too inelastic or plastic, a good place to start is by looking at your hydration. No matter what you're making, whether it starts from a dough or a batter, hydration is a significant portion of the, the, the total mass of that dough. So starting there and determining if it's acidic or basic or if there's fat in it, if there's a lot of salt, all those things can determine the qualities of that outcome. On the other hand, if something is dense or it's like super thick, some kind of kludgy, 
a good place to look at is how you're developing the gluten structure, whether it's a high gluten percentage in, in your flour, or if you're just overworking the dough or batter. There are some things that you just want to be really light and airy. Overworking your gluten structure is not going to help. You don't want it to develop that much gluten. And finally, if your baking ends up a little bit dry or gummy or it's really pale on top or something else, like a good place to start is proofing. It's really easy to get right once you know how to look for it. It's going to make a big difference if you really put the time in to check on if things are proofed correctly versus just following a recipe. My kitchen is different than your kitchen, temperatures are different, climates are different. It makes sense to just put in the effort to make sure that things are proofed correctly. So that's it. Gluten's really not that scary. It seems a little intimidating, but it's pretty chill. Unless you're allergic to it, in which case, fuck gluten. Those buckwheat pancakes were better anyway. Speaking of which, all those recipes and a lot more are over on kitchenomicon.com along with a bunch of the resources I've linked out to that help me put this all together. I've also got this whole experiment in more detail so you can find all the information you could possibly want on gluten. It's very obnoxious and fun. But anyway, that's it. Go conjure up something delicious. Check, check, check. There we go. Did I scare you? Yes. Amazing.